Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us with our Miller Shop Talk Live Aluminum Series. Tonight, we're going to be talking about uh, aluminum base material and selecting aluminum fil filler metals. Uh, my name is Chris Rail. I have been with Miller Electric for 35 years. Uh, for the last 17 years, I have been the product manager for the Millermatic products here at Miller Electric. Also with me tonight, we have two other individuals with us. Uh, Galen, if you could introduce yourself. Yep. Hi, my name is Galen White. I am the senior welding engineer for the Hobart Filler Metals Division. I've been with the ITW Welding Group for about 23 years. I um, spent about five and a half years in Appleton working for the uh, Miller Business Unit. And then for the last 12 years, I've been in Traverse City, Michigan. And I cover um, basically the eastern half of the United States. James, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is James Valpice. Um, I've been with Miller for about five years. Um, I'll be your guys' connection to the live uh, the live stream here tonight. So um, I'll be keeping up with the chat, hopefully, and um, bringing any questions that we get in the chat to the guys here on stream for them to to ask um, or to answer. Sorry. Um, if you do have some questions that might be more detailed, or you know, we might need a little bit more background to to get you an answer. Um, there is an email that you guys can uh, reach out to. It's shop talk live at millerwelds.com and we do go into that email and we we answer all those questions um, and if you know there's something in there that you know you ask us a question and we need some more detail that's a little bit easier for us to get that answer to you if we can kind of e email back and forth on that um, i'll put that email here in the chat for you guys um, the other thing um, is to check out our aluminum series page to stay up to date on future shop talk lives um, I will put that link in the chat here uh, throughout the episode and, and at the end of the stream as well. Um, you can also stay up to date and get notified when we go live by subscribing to our channel and um, enabling notifications. We do have another uh, Shop Talk Live aluminum series scheduled. This one will be on some more advanced MIG topics. That one is scheduled for May 11th. And like I said, I'll drop that link to that page. Um, I don't believe the uh, sign-up form is live yet, but um, it will be live soon. And when it is live, that will be the link that you guys can use to get to that. Um, Chris, back to you. All right, real good. So, uh, you know, when Galen and I are going to and visiting aluminum customers or talking to people at shows or talking to them over the telephone, uh, one of the most common questions we always get is, what filler metal should I use? Uh, but before we can answer that, we have to ask a couple more questions, uh, basically, like what's your base material or what attributes are going to be important to you? So, Galen, if you could, could you just cover some of the common aluminum base materials that people are welding? Yeah, sure. Um, I would say in manufacturing, what I'm seeing most commonly are, are two different groups, the 6000 series and the 5000 series. 6000 series being uh, probably the most most common is 6061 and then a close second would be 6063. Um, sometimes you'll see 6005 or even 6082, which is a higher strength version of 6061. Um, anytime you see an extrusion, it's almost always going to be a 6000 series. Those alloy families, because of the alloying elements, make them very economic, economical to extrude at a very high rate. Um, the next most common base metal series that you'll see is a 5000 series. Um, so a 5052 would probably what I see the most um, in general manufacturing. So in sheet um, or plate, but also you might see some 5005 or 5052. When you start getting into um, more heavy boat building or ship building, um, you might start seeing more 5086 or 5083. Um, every once in a while you'll see some diamond plate, which could be like 3003 or it could be um, 6061 also. Very good. So looking at the aluminum, how do you know what type of material is? Is there any trick of the trade or a rule of thumb that you can apply to determining what aluminum you are, your base material is? Yeah, um, yes and no. Um, if you're lucky, the material will be embossed or stamped or printed on it. A lot of times, you know, on, on 6061, sheet you'll see C, um, 6061 t6511 um, if it's not stamped or etched on there 
there might be a tag if there's a bundle of material. Um, you know, if, if there's not a tag that shows the alloy, you might have to talk to your purchaser and they might have to go to the, the manufacturer of that sheet or extrusion or plate um, because sometimes it does make a big difference, you know, what filler alloy you're going to use. Um, filler metals, there's, there are a couple things, like if you have a spool of wire that somehow the label got ripped off, um, there's what's called a ring test. And I was going to do it um, on this live stream, but unfortunately the sound doesn't come through real well. But if you take a, a, a small piece of 4043 and you drop it on a table, it'll kind of make more of a thud sound. Um, the 5000 series wires, because they have a high magnesium content, when we draw them down, they work harden, so it has more of a ring. But here is another test. If you take a soft alloy, so like 4043, and you wrap it around your finger, um, it's going to kind of stick to your finger. It won't want to come off. Whereas if you do the same thing with a 5000 series wire, because it's it work hardens, it's a stiffer wire, it'll have a tendency to want to just kind of fall off. So it'll kind of spring back off a little bit. Um, sometimes when you got guys that are doing some repair work on a, like a dump truck, um, a lot of times those are made out of 6061 or base materials that can be welded with either 4043 or 5356. So if you're going to repair a weld, you want to repair the weld with the same alloy that it was manufactured with. Um, so uh, if, if you don't know what it's manufactured out of, you know, you can call us. We, I, I'm, I'm familiar with a lot of the different manufacturers, so I can kind of help you figure out what alloy it is. Um, or sometimes this trick works, sometimes it doesn't. If you are able to clean the weld and wire brush it really well and you spray some easy off oven cleaner on it, sometimes that will make the, the weld discolor. If it discolors, it turns more of a dark color. That's an indication that it was welded with the 4000 series um, filler metal. But again, you know, that's that's kind of a guess. It's best to contact the manufacturer to find out which alloy it was welded with before you repair it. Very good. OK, what about cast alloys? How can you tell if it's cast? Um, if it's an, OK, so if you think of irregular shapes, um, there's two times where you see irregular shapes, castings and extrusions, and usually it's fairly clear that if it is if it's an extrusion because the profile is going to be the same the full length but if it's an odd shape where um, there's just no way that it can be you know fabricated um, or if it's got a rough surface um, that's another indication that it's a cast or if it's broken um, you know usually castings are a little bit more likely to crack or break for some reason um, one other thing I thought too was as far as your your previous question how you can know um, there are I'm not saying you go out and buy one of these but there are handheld portable I think you call it XRF scanners or X-ray fluorescent, where you can just take this and butt it up to a piece of aluminum, scan it within a few seconds, and it will tell you um, how much aluminum, how much magnesium, silicon, copper, um, those kind of things. Right. So. Well, that's neat stuff. Real good. So we talked about a little bit about base materials. Now, can you talk about some of the common aluminum filler metals? Yeah, if you go into any welding distributor in the United States, almost every store will have at least two different alloys in either MIG or TIG. Um, the two most common are 4043 and 5356. And the reason why almost every distributor carries those is I would say probably 80% of the base metal combinations can be, can be welded with those two alloys. Now, 4043 or 5356 might not be the perfect filler metal selection um, because the application is going to dictate what the best filler metal is, but the welds will hold. Um, so yeah, 4043 and 5356 are the most common. Biggest differences being the alloying elements. So 4043 has roughly 5% silicon and uh, 5356 has about 5% magnesium. And those different alloying elements really change how they perform um, and how they weld. Okay. All right. So we talked about that. So as far as what are some of the differences between these common filler metals? So, yeah, so 4043 and 5356, um, if you were to give 10 welders the option to weld with 4043 or 5356, um, most of them would pick 4043 if they wanted the best looking welds. And because of the silicon, um, because of its um, melting properties, its low melting temperature, 
Um, it's going to produce a weld that's brighter and shinier when you're MIG welding. It's going to produce less smoke, less um, smut, that black soot along the edges of the weld, um, less spatter. Um, but it, unfortunately, it has lower strength and it has uh, lower calm strength. It's a softer wire. So you saw when I wrapped it around my finger, it, it formed to my finger better. So it doesn't feed quite as well. Um, whereas 5356 is going to give you a lot stronger weld. Um, it's going to feed better because it's got higher column strength, but you do have to um, sacrifice a little bit of the um, cosmetic appeal. Um, and, you know, for years and years and years, we've had customers ask, asking us, you know, we would love to have a wire that welds like 4043, but gave us the strength of 5356. And we'll talk a little bit about this um, later in the presentation, but um, we developed an alloy called 4943 that gives you all the benefits of 4043, um, but gives you a strength very close to the 5356. So we kind of mash the two up and are able to give the best of both worlds. That's, that's, that's good stuff, really good. So, okay, so we talked about the different types of materials. Why should we care about having the best match? of our filler material to our uh, base material right yeah so there are certain um, situations certain base metal combinations where if you choose the wrong filler metal you can have catastrophic results or you can just have um, an unsightly weld so here's just two examples um, on the left um, the left hand side picture this is a handrail that I, is a picture i took at downtown disney in orlando florida and um, if i had to guess this is probably 60 61 T6 tubing, and you can see that there's three welds. The weld in the middle has um, a little bit better, clo um, closer uh, color match, and that was probably welded with 5356. Then you can see for whatever reason they had to splice in a small chunk in the center, and those two welds on the outside are very, uh, very dark. So those are probably welded with 4043. Um, another example in the upper right hand corner is another handrail that was. Um, I think it was at a hospital in Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, that had a, a clear coat anodized. And you can see that definitely has a darker weld bead, whereas if they would have used 5356, it would have had a much um, closer color match. Um, the picture in the bottom right is some sort of a um, exhaust manifold component for um, the marine industry. So I don't know exactly what the temperature is, but there are certain base metals and filler metals, so the 5000 series base metals and filler metals that have um, more than 5% magnesium, they're susceptible to stress corrosion cracking in elevated temperature applications. Um, and for aluminum, it, that, that elevated temperature range is fairly low in my opinion. So the danger zone for aluminum um, is 150F to 350F. So those are, those are just two applications where choosing the wrong filler metal could cause some some major problems. You could have some cracking that developed in the future. Now, oh, Galen, you mentioned anodizing. Could you talk a little bit what anodizing is and why uh, some applications are anodized? Right, yeah, so there's a couple of reasons why you might want to anodize something. Um, one of them is to provide um, extra protection. So aluminum oxide, um, there's aluminum oxide on all aluminum. So if you wire brush aluminum uh, within seconds, that um, aluminum oxide is gonna start to form. And aluminum oxide is very hard. It's the second hardest element known to man, only second to diamond. Um, so if you wanna make that, that oxide thicker um, very quickly, you can do an anodizing. I think they use sulfuric acid and they put it in a bath where they apply a certain voltage and current to it and it forces that aluminum oxide to grow very thick very quickly. So now you have a very hard surface. Um, and then other some other reasons why would be if you wanted to change the color of it. So sometimes if you don't want to paint aluminum, you could anodize it um, and anodize it and, and, and dye it black or whatever color you want. So usually hardness and or changing the color of it are the two reasons why you would anodize. All right, good. All right, so we covered a lot of information so far. We talked about base materials. We talked about filler materials. We talked about anodizing, um, matching uh, your base material to your your film filler material. Uh, James, do we have any uh, questions out there on the chat that uh, you want to share with us? Uh, we did get a couple questions. So, um, 
we did get asked, uh, does inducing helium shielding gas or using helium shielding gas when welding thicker aluminum hurt the integrity of the filler metal or the, uh, the hurt the strength of the weld itself? Um, I would say, well, it's that's kind of a it's a two part question. Um, you're not going to affect the strength of the filler metal, but you could affect the strength of the base material. So um, when you're welding a non heat treatable base metal, um, say, for instance, you're doing a transverse butt weld on a non heat treatable. The depending on the temper, so say, for instance, you have 5086H34 base material, you're going to have a tensile strength. I'm just going to guess of 40 KSI before you weld it. And in that heat affected zone, um, when you do a full pen butt weld, um, you're going to take that down to the O temper of 5086. I don't know what that number is, but it's going to take it down to the dead soft. So it doesn't matter what the heat input is, is in the heat affected zone of a non heat treatable because it's always going to go to the O temper. Now you might make that heat affected zone bigger and wider, um, but you can't go any lower than O temper in a non heat treatable. In the heat treatable alloys, yes, you can. Um, if you put too much heat in there, re either through your volts, amps, your travel speed, or the addition of helium, um, you can potentially um, negatively affect the, the strength of the weld, meaning the heat affected zone or base metal. Um, so, so talking about the heat input, what helium does is um, it is a um, has a higher ionization potential. So what it does is um, it allows you to run a higher voltage at a shorter arc length. So normally when people use helium, they're welding on thicker materials and usually it's with a 5000 series wire, um, which has a little bit more of a wide penetration profile just because of how the way the wire melts and transfers across the arc. But it also has a um, higher thermal conductivity. So if you look at and think about traditional shielding gas for MIG and TIG, we use argon, which is um, really um, a poor conductor of heat. So if you think about where argon is used as an insulator, if you think about newer homes that have um, high energy efficient windows, they're usually argon filled. And they do that because you want to keep the heat out right in the summertime or you want to keep the heat in in the wintertime so that argon doesn't transfer the heat very well in that window, nor does it transfer heat very well in a welding arc. So helium has about 10 times the thermal conductivity that argon does. So it allows you to get even more heat because of the shorter arc length of the higher voltage, but also through the higher thermal conductivity um, of the shielding gas. All right. Perfect. Yeah. And some other questions we've got here. Um, uh, Alex asked, is anodized aluminum used in marine applications more? And I think that's something that, um, you know, we commonly get that question, you know, mm -hmm on boats and docks and stuff like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say yes. I mean, um, I would say tuna towers, boat towers, those guys typically used pre anodized tubing. Um, I would say I would never recommend trying to MIG weld on anodized without removing the anodized coating before you weld it. Um, it's common practice though, to TIG weld over top of it and they use what's called a bump bump technique where you just have an on off switch and these guys just kind of bump it on and off and the first time they bump it pushes that um anodizing back and then they'll bump it again to add filler metal um and then you know in the marina industry a lot of times you know on pontoon boats the hand the, the railing around the boat they'll they'll tig weld it with five three five six and then they'll post weld anodize it and one of the questions I think you touched on earlier a little bit, we just got a question here from Curtis asking, you know, is there a quick weld test to determine the alloy of an unknown base metal? I think you touched on that a little bit earlier, but can you just kind of cover that again real quick? How to figure out what the base metal is if you don't know. Right. Yeah, unfortunately, um, it's not like steel or cast iron where you can hit it with a grinder and tell. Um, as far as I know, there is no inexpensive way to just pick up a piece of aluminum and know what alloy it is unless it's unless it's marked or if it's 
if it's an extrusion, you can you can kind of assume that it's a six thousand series, but I don't I wouldn't I wouldn't bet my life on it or I won't bet that fifty bucks on it if I was gonna build something out of it. I mean if it's yeah, if it's something that you're doing around your house, fine, but if it's something that could cause damage or harm to someone, you know structural. Yeah, you gotta you gotta know for sure what it is. Because I mean even there's there's some six thousand series alloys that they add lead to to make them you know machine much faster and you know if you grab a piece of that and you try welding on it you know the weld might fail because of the lead gotcha yeah um other question we got here where do you typically see 5554 filler metal being used do you know of any uh, specific applications yeah that that is um specifically designed for welding 5454 plate and usually that is the 5000 series base metal that has the highest magnesium level, both in the in the sheet 5454 and the filler metal 5554, where you can use that in an elevated temperature application. So normally gotcha. that's where you see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, this this uh, this commenter says that they the they with do Ford. air to water intercoolers. So mm. that yeah. seems like a yeah. good application for that filler metal. Yep. Um, another kind of common question we get are, you know, what alloys aren't weldable? We've talked a lot about what alloys are common, what alloys are weldable. Um, are there some alloys yeah. or some specific applications where you see those alloys? Yeah, probably the most common, the two most common are 70, 75 and 2024. 20, those are high strength aerospace aluminum alloys that are usually, you know, extrusions or plates that are bolted bolted or fastened together and they're just not weldable there's other 2000 and 7000 series alloys that are weldable but those are the two most common for sure perfect yeah i think we've got most of the most of the questions answered all right real good all right so next thing i want we want to talk about a little bit more is earlier i said you know when people ask what kind of fill, filler material they want to use uh, we always say, you know, what's your base material? What attributes are important to you? So when you say attributes, you know, what are the key things we need to think about when selecting the filler material? Right. So um, if a if a, a customer calls me and says, hey, Galen, I, what filler metal do I use? The first thing I'm going to do is obviously I ask them what the base metal is. But then once we determine what that is, um, you know, the, these are the criteria that are up on the screen. So cracking. Um, and, and cracking, when we're talking filler metal selection, is not in-service weld failure. This is talking about hot cracking. So if you look at uh, some of the base materials, and some of the, the most common base materials have very, very crack-sensitive chemistries. I would say, you know, the most common, 6061, if you looked at the crack sensitivity, se sensitivity curve for that alloy, the chemistry falls very, very near the peak of that crack sensitivity curve. So you'll almost never see 6061 welded autogenously or without the addition of filler metal because the chances are it would it will probably crack. So you would want to pick a filler metal that has a chemistry that's um, much different than the base metal you're welding to get it away from that um, crack sensitivity curve. So, it, you know, is it is the base material crack sensitive? Um, strength is strength very important. You know, is this going to be an application where, um, you know, it's going to be under a load, you know, either static or dynamic. So when you're looking at a filler metal selection chart and it's got a rating under strength, um, if you're looking at a transverse tensile strength, if it has any rating at all, even it has even if it has a C or a D for that filler metal, that means that that filler metal will produce a weld that is um meets the minimum strength requirements of that base metal combination if you're in a fillet weld scenario where you're making fillet welds now that rating means a little bit something a little bit more so if there is a a b and c um, for strength um, the a would mean out of those filler metals in that box a is going to be the strongest b is going to be the next strongest and c is going to be the next strongest um, for instance, say for instance, ductility is important. Say for instance, you're welding some tubing and you've got to roll it or form it into some shape. You would want to use a filament that's got high ductility. So the ability to bend without fracturing, or if you're going to be in a um, corrosive environment and these ratings are based on fresh water and salt water. 
So um, what you would want to do is weld a base metal that has a, or weld with a filament metal that has a very, very different electrical potential. So say for instance, you're building a ship and you're using it in salt water and the electrical potential is very different from the base metal to the filament metal. Um, you can set up a, a electrolytic cell and either the base metal or the filament metal could be the sacrificial anode and start um, eroding away. So normally you want the filler metal to be slightly less electrically negative. So the base metal, the ship, which has a lot more surface area to sacrifice is the one that's eroded if there is any erosion. Um, temperature, we talked about that a little bit before. Um, the, the danger zone, if it's an in-service um, elevated temperature application, the 150 to 350 F. Um, if you're below that, it's not a problem. If you're above that, it's not a problem either. So it's just at 150 to 350. Color would be um, post weld anodizing. We talked about, you know, the 5000, 6000 series base metals anodizing almost white or a light kind of light silver or gray. Um, 4000 series filler metals have the tendency to, to anodize uh, more of a dark gray because of the silicon. And then PWHT stands for post weld heat treatment. So there are certain base metals and filler metals that will respond or increase in strength when subjected to a um, post weld age or a post weld heat treatment in age so um, one application would be um, so i don't know if you've heard of the james webb telescope that nasa just built and they sent up into orbit i think it was on december 24th um, their sif frame um, they built and they needed to have a you know had to have a certain strength level and um, they actually contacted us about uh, filler metal that would give them higher strength than what they were able to get with any commercially available alloy. Um, it just happened to be that we are getting ready to release 4943. Um, and what they did was they welded 6061 T4 with 4943, built this whole frame, and then put it into a big oven and aged it to bring the tensile strength up um, quite a few KSI to get the strength that they needed. Um, and then toughness is kind of a combination of ductility and strength. Toughness is the ability to withstand um, fracture or cracking upon um, impact loading. So, I mean, there's certain situations where toughness is more important than strength. Um, the example I like to give is we have a customer um, that use our wire called BAE Systems. They make um, armored personnel carrier for the military and they weld um, 5083 plate which is a higher strength um, armor plating and they actually use 5356 because of its high toughness even though it has lower tensile strength than the 5183. They're most concerned about driving over an IED and having these things blow up and blow apart whereas with the 5356 because of its higher toughness it can withstand um, that high impact and the welds will uh, won't fail. Good. All right. Now, we talk about welding all the time. You talk toughness, strength. Can you talk a little bit more about what we mean by strength of the weld? Yeah. Um, so let's look at this um, sample here. This is a, a weld sample that I performed for NASA when they were evaluating 4043, 4643, and 4943. Um, and this is a sample, like I said, was 6061T4, and then they post weld aged it. So these strength values are being much higher than you would normally see out of um, these filament metals in the as well the condition. So if you look at the, the left hand side, that scale is hardness. So they, they did a micro hardness test and they, there's enough historical data that you can get a correlation between the hardness and the actual tensile strength. So hardness scale on the left, um, tensile strength on the right. And if you look at the base metal strength on the left, um, you know, it's around, you know, 48, um, KSI that is in the um, non welded condition. And then as you move to the center of the weld, you can see the blue um, strength level is at around 37, 38 KSI. That's 4043. So they're, that's higher than normal. Normally, 4043 is going to give you 28 KSI. So, you know, I there's some base metal dilution. I picked up some of the, the magnesium from the 6061 and brought it into the, the base metal. Um, if you move up a little bit, you see the green band, which is 4643, that's got a little bit of alloying element to give it some strength. And then the strongest of the three is the 4943, hitting in around 44 um, 
KSI. Um, so if you were to take and pull that, and if it broke through the center, um, the 49-43 would be the clear winner. Unfortunately, if you look at the heat affected zone on the either the left side or the right side of the weld, that's where the base metal is um, overaged, and that's where the weakest part of the weld is going to be. So all three of those tensile bars probably broke in the heat affected zone in the base metal. So people ask me all the time, well, what's the benefit of 4943? Because if I just pull a tensile bar and it breaks in the in the base metal, why did I um, use 4943? And that's a good question. Um, really, where, where you see the benefit um, is in fillet welds. So if you look at a fillet weld where um, you know almost 100% of the weld is filler metal, I mean, you'll get maybe some base metal dilution, but I would say 80 to 90% of the weld is going to be filler metal that's where you see a dramatic increase in weld strength because um you know the throat of the weld with it being majority uh, of, of base or filler metal is going to give you a much stronger stronger weld and i mean even in a transverse butt weld if you have any discontinuities if you have any lack of fusion or porosity having a stronger filler metal is going to help buffer that and keep it from fracturing where with a with a lower strength um, filler metal, you could have some failures through the weld. Okay. What kind of strength differences are there between the different fill filler metals? Yeah, it's pretty pretty dramatic. So if you look at um, all the way down on the left-hand side, that's 1100. That's basically 99% um, pure aluminum. Um, as you go across to the right, you'll start seeing um, strengths increase. So the first three are 4000 series, so 4043. Um, and these strengths are um, the minimum filamental strengths. So these are a little bit lower than what you would see um, as compared to the typicals. These come out of um, the AWS A510 filamental specification. So as a manufacturer of aluminum welding wire, these are the minimum um, all weld metal um, tensile strengths that you have to hit in order to call it 4043 or 4943 or 5356. Um, so as you, you can see going from left to right in the 5000 series, um, basically what's causing that increase in strength is the um, percent magnesium is increasing and you're starting to get a little bit addition of manganese in the 5183 and the 5556. Wow. So you can see there's a, a big difference. I mean, I think I see 10,000 or 11,000 KSI for 1100 up to around 42 KSI for the 55, 56. So there's a big difference in tensile of strengths. Well, yeah. So looking at aluminum, obviously, you know, steel seems a lot more basic. Aluminum, there's a lot more variables and a lot of more things to take into consideration and look at, you know, to, to determine, you know, what we need to do and what material we need to use to, uh, you know, make the, the welds we're looking for. So yep, for yeah, sure. that is some good stuff. So James, any uh, new, uh, chats coming in any more questions you have for us um yeah we actually just had a a question comes through asking more about the base metal and the filler metal but um what grades of aluminum are good for bending or this you know sometimes with 60 61 you end up with cracking when you bend so yeah so um each each alloy and each temper is going to be different so in um, aluminum standards and data that's a book that's put out by the aluminum association that will give you minimum bending radiuses for different thicknesses of different grades and tempers um, but if you want to if if you're looking at 60 61 if you need to bend something usually people will go with t4 i mean if you don't have to do any welding o temper is the best because it's, it's dead soft but you don't want to weld heat treatable alloys so the 2000 6,000 and 7,000 series in the O temper, you can have some problems with like liquidation cracking. Um, but you know, T4, if you can get it, um, that will that will bend much easier than a T6. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, what are the differences in how 5053 and 4043, or 5553, sorry, or 5356? Okay. Um, you know, what are the, the key differences in how those weld? Like when you're welding, are you going to notice those differences? Yeah, for sure. 
Um, and that's why if, you, if you're welding on a, a piece of equipment that has pulse, you'll have a different program for 5356 and 4043. So there's a lot of differences. You've got the electrical conductivity. That's a big difference. You've got the melting temperatures. Um, so if I could, if you were to able to, to look at um, the welding arc and the transfer under a high-speed camera, it would be kind of like, um, 5356 would be kind of like buckshot, and 4043 would be more like a slug. So if you had a 12-gauge with buckshot, um, and you're really close to the paper and you're going to shoot, shoot a, a target, um, the closer you are with buckshot, the tighter that pattern is and the, the tighter the penetration, the farther you get away, the more spread out it's going to be. Um, so that's why you typically don't want to run 5356 five, with a long arc length because um, you've got some spatter and the, the heat the heat and the penetration or the, the amperage is, is a little bit more spread out. 4000 series wires are more like a slug. They come across in distinct droplets, so they're more penetrating. Um, so you can run a little bit longer arc length. So um, I would say those are probably the biggest differences. Um, they, because the, re the electrical resistivity of the wire, you have to run a little bit higher wire feed speeds with 5356 to get the same amperage level. So I would say about 20 to 25% higher wire feed speeds with 5356 to get the same amperage levels. Mm -hmm. All right, that's- So if you wanna, if you wanna go fast, if, if speed is the is your only concern, five three five six, you can run faster than forty forty three. Right, and that's even like on some of our smaller millimatic machines. We have different types of spool guns with different uh, motors in it with different gear ratios. So, like Galen said, uh, you know the the Spoolmate one hundred is only for the four thousand series because it doesn't have the higher wire feed speed range that you know some of the other guns have that you would have that you need for the five thousand series aluminums. And the other thing when you're welding, you know with MIG welding, you know, with uh, the 4000 series or the 4043s, you know, there's more silicon in it, like Galen said before. So when you're done welding, that weld is nice and shiny. It's nice and smooth. It really flows and wets in good at the toes where the, you know, the 5000 series has a little bit more smoke or smut, as he said, when you got done welding. So usually, you know, the weld for a 5000 series will look a little bit more, one is as shiny as, as you're yeah, welding. With it's the a little rougher. Series. Yeah. Gotcha. Perfect. Um, we did get a question here as well. Can you um, repeat the name of that book that you mentioned earlier? I think that. Um, yeah, it's called Standards and Data. It's it's put out by the Aluminum Association. Okay, Standards and Data. Yep. Um, another question we got here is: What filler would be best suited for temperature changing applications? Say thirty two degrees up to two hundred plus. I think. That would probably largely depend on the base metal, but are there any? Yeah, kinda... so so because you're going through that 150, you disqualify 5356, the only um, 5000 series filler alloy that would be able to um, be used in that situation would be 5554 um, because it's got a low, it's got below 3% magnesium, so you don't have to worry about stress corrosion cracking. Um, that's provided that the base material is compatible with that filler metal, um, but any of the the 4000 series wires would work in that temperature range. Actually, um, here's an interesting little fact about aluminum. You know, typically with steel, if you're in in um, low temperature applications, you have to have a special filler metal um, because you need to have good impact properties, and it's harder to do at lower temperatures with steel. All aluminum alloys increase in strength and toughness as the temperature goes down. So once they get below zero and in cryogenic applications, the strength and toughness goes up with all aluminum alloys. It's kind of interesting, I think. Mm -hmm. um, one other question here. What would be a good base metal or what would we recommend as a base metal for something like a fuel tank? Um, well, I would say um, I'm trying to think what most of them are made of. I would say a lot of the, you want something that you can form and roll. So I would say probably 50, 52. I'd have to look through some of the different standards. Um, I can't think right off the top of my head, it, you know, if I can give you an exact alloy, but I would say probably 50, 52 is, is fairly common. Gotcha. Um, what would you, 
weld 50-52 with? Would that be like a 40-43 or a 49-43? You know, this is one thing that I think I've got a little bit of information on. There, so there's obviously some DOT regulations um, for fuel containers. So they have to do drop tests at certain levels. So you'd want to have something that's got good um, impact properties. So, you know, your my first, my gut instinct is to tell you to give you a wire that's going to have the less, the, the fewest number of leaks, which would be 4043. But you have to be careful because um, if it's got to, if it's got to pass a drop test, then you got to look at something that's got higher toughness, which would be a 5356. So from an impact standpoint, that's what I would say you would probably want to go with, um, even though you would be more susceptible to uh, uh, maybe a few more leaks because you don't have that silicon in there to help wet it out. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, maybe this, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this one and then we can kind of move forward a little bit. But um, we have a question here. Is the per, it's the percentage of magnesium that determines the high temp range? Yes, you have to be below 3% mag in the base metal and the filler metal if you're going to be in that 150 to 350 temp range. Otherwise, you can have problems with stress corrosion cracking. You get um, preferential um, grain, I can't remember what it's called, but you get some of the, the, the constituents in the base alley will start to migrate to the grains and they can start having issues with cracking. Gotcha. Um, so just one last reminder from me. Um, if you want to stay up to date on any of our future Shop Talk Lives, we do have uh, advanced MIG seminar coming up here um, May 11th. So we'll be talking a little bit about Pulse MIG, kind of how we uh, how we tune the arc behind the scenes and what some of the different uh, settings are. Uh, that you guys can change on your end and, and what those settings do to the arc. We'll have some really good um, video footage where, where we'll be able to show you what the differences are and, and what those specific things do. Um, so again, that, that one will be May 11th um, and you can either sign up for that. Uh, once that registration page goes live, I'll, I'll drop the link to that registration page um, in the chat here shortly. Um, so you can either sign up that way or you can always uh, subscribe to our channel and turn notifications on and then you'll get notified when we do go live um, just in case you know you miss the the registration for some reason um, Chris all right so like I said those are a lot of good questions as far as base materials what alloy do I use so on and so forth I guess Galen are there what tools are out there to help these people select what filler and base material matches are the best yeah so every aluminum filamental manufacturer that I know of has their own version of a filamental selection chart and that's really what you should use um, for guidance uh, it won't have every base metal on there um, and sometimes a customer will call me with a, a, a base metal that's not on here so I'll have to go and look up that chemistry and cross-reference it with something else and and, and, and make an educated guess um, but the way this works is you look at the the gray column on the left you find your first base metal in that you find your second base metal along the top gray column then you find the box where uh, those that row and column intersect and then you've got a box with letters in it. So d depending on if you're most concerned with, you know, crack sensitivity or strength or ductility, there's going to be some letters in there. And just just know that those values or those letters are only um, th the relationship only exists within that box. You, an A in this box is not comparable to an A in another box. Um, so this is a great tool. Um, this is we have this filamental chart in the back of our aluminum guide that's available online and if you want a larger size we make a wall size chart which makes it a little bit easier to see if your um, eyesight isn't the greatest but i think what works even better is we have a hobart app that's available for download on either your google store or itunes whatever if you have an android or iphone um, the app i think works so much better because it takes um, a little bit of the confusion out so if you were to pull up the app, James, if you can show that. 
Um, there's a couple other things on this app that I like to use. It, it, the fill metal needed for a job is pretty handy. Every once in a while, maybe a couple times a year, I'll get a customer that'll call me up and say, hey, I've got this job. Can you tell me how much fill metal I need? And you can go in there. If you click on that, um, you can pick whatever joint you have. If it's a, a fillet weld or a butt weld, um, you can click on that. You can put in the weld size. So if you put in the point, point zero six two five, you want to do this real quick, James, point zero six two five, or no, point point two five in the, yeah, FRE, put point zero six two five. And then for L2, put point two five oh. So FRE, that's just a face reinforcement. That's just the amount of concavity or convexity. Yep. And then just click next. Um, and then we're going to pick aluminum to top and spray transfer. Let's say I have a thousand feet of weld. So now for a thousand feet of weld, that's a quarter inch fillet. I need to buy roughly 54 pounds of wire. So it's kind of handy to have that we can kind of budget for the job. But you need to know, you know, the weld size and the, the linear inches of um, yeah. weld you have. Also a nice tool for steel and stainless also. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Works for, works for those alloys as well. And there's also a heat input calculator and the deposition calculator. Um, but what I use this mostly for is the um, aluminum filler metal selection chart. So if you click on that, and we'll just pick 6061 welded to 6061, you can just see all the different um, filler metal combinations that are available. So this kind of takes some of the guesswork out of it. You don't have to worry about um, you know, making, you know, getting the right box. It just shows you the one. Um, so definitions, I like, I like the definitions button. So if you're unsure what cracking means, if you click on definitions, it's going to give you what that means. Um, but let's say for instance, let's run a scenario. Um, okay. We're welding 6061 to 6061 and we're going to post weld anodize that. So color, right? We're most concerned with color. Um, so we want to use something that has an A or a B. Okay, so A, um, 5183, 5356, 5554, 5556, and 5654. Okay, so um, wouldn't, you, wouldn't want to use 4043 or 4943 or 4047 because it's going to anodize dark gray. Okay, so now let's add another little wrinkle to it. Let's say it's going to be in an elevated temperature application in addition to being post weld anodized. So now we got to find a rating that has something in color, but also has a rating in temperature. So it's got to have both temperature and color. So the only one that's going to work for that is 5554. So that's how that works. Um, I don't know if you're going to share our emails, James, but you know, as another resource, you, know, you can always reach out to me um, and email me or text me if you have questions about filamental selection. I'm always um, willing to help out. Sometimes it's just um, it's a little bit daunting, and you know it's always best to know for sure what the 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 best filler metal is for a particular application beforehand, rather than after yeah, the fact. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Any more questions? Um, we did get a couple more questions here. So, what tungsten should we use with 6061 tubing? The same tungsten you would use for any other aluminum welding. I would say the serrated or lanthanatum, I think, is what they typically yep. recommend for welding aluminum. Yep. Serrated, yep. yeah. It doesn't matter what alloy you're welding with aluminum. It's all, it uses the same tungsten for all aluminum alloys. Right. Yeah. Tungsten's not the consumable. It's the, the filler rod that's being yep. consumed. Um, is there a way to fix distortion in aluminum without having to recut and reweld and all of that? Yeah, so there's a couple things you can do, like say for instance a fillet weld. Um, you know, if you got a fillet, you're trying to make a weld here and it's pulling this way. You can pre-cant it, so when you weld it, it pulls it into the perfect plane. That's one way to do it. Um, making the weld size as small as possible. Um, you know, controlling the heat input um, on a fillet weld. If you can bevel the plate and make the weld closer to the neutral axis, it's going to make it distort less. Those are two. Two or three easy ways right there. Gotcha. Another actually another one that's is going to help a little bit. Um, the 4000 series filler metals have silicon and silicon has a unique property that it expands when it solidifies. So if you are welding and this is particularly helpful on 
thin sheet and you have to remember it has to be an alloy that's compatible but uh, 4047 is a 4000 series filler metal that has 12% uh, silicon. So in addition to it being um, even brighter and shinier welds, it's going to wet out even better. And because it has 12% silicon, that's 12% silicon is going to expand as the weld contracts. So it will kind of offset some of that shrinkage and distortion. It's most noticeable on, on thinner stuff where you get kind of that potato chip um, bowing, you know, kind of wrinkles the sheet. It helps a little bit there. Um, one other question that we got in a previous Shot Talk Live that I, I feel like it's important to answer is, how do you clean filler metal, especially like MIG, MIG filler metal that's left in the machine? Can you clean it once it's been oxidized? Um, yeah, I guess it depends on what the contaminant is. If it's grinding dust or things like that, you know, you might be able to just strip a few layers off if it's just something that's been, you know, building up on the top. If it's been you know, sprayed with some sort of coolant or, you know, something where it can get in too, you know, many layers deep, I would say it's it's not any good. Or if it's been, if it's gone through several um, dew point crossings where you might have um, hydrated aluminum oxide on it, where the wire looks kind of almost chalky or dusty, um, you know, even though you strip layers off, you keep seeing like a white chalky residue that's indication that it's um, got excessive uh, hydrated aluminum oxide, which could lead to an erratic arc or, you know, higher than normal porosity in the welds. It's funny you say that. I know some of our coworkers, when they go to customers, they would bring their aluminum spools of wire into the hotel with, room with them, <laughs> just so that way they would, you know, wouldn't get guilty. cold in the vehicle, right? So I'm guilty. That way they, right. So again, that's yep. all the. That stuff is all important when you're, uh, yeah. you know, using aluminum wire. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's no different than when you take a can of Coke out of a refrigerator. You know, when you bring it into a warm environment, it's going to start to sweat. You know, you got that um, cold temperature. You got, you know, warmer air has a tendency to um, condense on the on the can. The same thing is true with wire. Um, you know, if it's cold enough, and even though you might not see it, it, it depending on the humidity level, I mean, at, at higher right. humidity levels, it only takes three or four degrees of difference between the base metal or filler metal and the air temperature before you can start having, you know, moisture condensing on the, the wire or the base material. Yeah. Another question that we got, I think we've gotten this one before as well is, you know, how do you, if you're TIG welding, especially, how do you determine a good, like, what's a good rule of thumb for determining filler rod diameter? So how, how, how large a filler metal you should be using? You know, I, I I don't maybe Chris, you know have a rule. I don't know a rule. I just kind of just go by feel. No, it's just by feel and right that position. I guess the main thing is you know your tongue sense dies to the you know the the filler material. That's more of a you know better ratio that you want to be looking for. But as far as what rod are you using for what material, I guess it's I mean, I, more of a personal if, preference. If, if you're using too big of a filler, like grossly too big, you know it's gonna be obvious where you're putting down far too large of droplets um, for the material thickness and you're having to back off on the amperage um, or vice versa. If you're using way too small of a TIG filler, you're just having to jam it in so yeah, fast. Jamming, yeah. You know, you're just waste, you know, you just can't get it in there fast enough for the size weld that you're trying to make. Gotcha. Perfect. Um, yeah. Any more questions? I, I think we've answered most of the ones that we've gotten here in the chat. Right. Um, yeah, any other questions, feel free to either throw them in the chat here. We'll hang out for a couple more minutes. Or, um, again, we've dropped that link to our uh, Shot Talk Live at MillerWells.com email in the chat. If you've got suggestions for future episodes, if you'd like to see us do some series like this on you know, stainless steel or uh, carbon steel, I know Galen's crying inside right now because he's all about <laughs> the aluminum. But, um, yeah, if, I mean, it, it, any of those comments and we've gotten some of those here in the chat already tonight about potentially doing a stainless steel version of this um so feel free to email those those suggestions to us at uh shop talk live at millerwelds.com um we did get one more question here um do we have any tips for using the 211 with a spool gun and 4043 filler metal um as as far as using a spool gun or a mig gun i guess the main uh, the, you know, the 
tips we have, if you will, is uh, number one, obviously clean your base material, you know, first and foremost, you know, try to get that aluminum oxide layer off. Uh, but the other main thing that you want to always do is when you're weld, make welding, I don't know if you can see it here with my uh, little simulator, but uh, for aluminum welding, you always want to have it so you have a push angle. So you always have your, your gun is pointing forward and you're pushing and getting that, you know, the, the gun angle out in front. On steel, you can push it or drag it, but on aluminum, when you're dragging it, you're going to have some issues. You're going to have blacker welds. Uh, so, you know, the main thing that we need to talk about uh, welding with that is to get in here and push with your gun angle. Uh, the other thing when people are just learning to weld a MIG weld aluminum uh, coming from steel is a lot of times when people are welding steel, they go slow and they all manipulate the torch and make circles or half C's or whatever it is and take their time going across their base material. When you're welding uh, aluminum, you're in a spray transfer, so it's hot. So you got to get in and you got to get going. So if you go and you spend too much time in one spot, you're going to distort the metal. You might even burn through the material. So the main thing is you want to have a push angle. And once you get going, you know, start moving. Uh, sometimes people just go and do a little stitch motion to get that stacked dime look. Uh, but basically, that's only torch manipulation you really need to do when you're you're MIG welding with a, a spool gun or any MIG process. Um, another question here, can, can you talk a little bit, we talked kind of briefly on post weld heat treat and how that can increase weld strength or strength of the overall weld mint. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that and kind of some applications maybe that you've seen use that? Um, obviously the, the most recent one was the James Webb telescope, um, but anytime, you know, heat treatable alloys, 6061 T4 is kind of a perfect application for the use of 4943. Um, you'll get strengthening in the base metal, in the heat affected zone, and in the weld metal. So you might not be able to get right all the way back up to um, the unaffected base metal of 42, but you'll definitely get a pop and bring that the heat affected zone, which is usually the weakest link, um, up. And with 4943, because of the chemistry, it is fully heat treatable. You don't have to get any base metal dilution at all. So it doesn't matter if you have penetration or not. 4943 will respond fully to the um, heat treatment. But I mean, there's other castings too. I mean, maybe like A356 casting, you know, those are heat treatable sometimes. Um, sometimes those are repaired with uh, 4943 for, the reason, that, for that reason. Perfect. Um, well, it looks like we've gotten most of the questions answered here in the chat. Like I said, again, uh, you know, if you have questions that we didn't answer here, feel free to email those to us. We do monitor that email inbox and we, you know, even if it's not necessarily on filler metal, um, we do have, um, I'm actually the one that looks through those emails and I'll send those questions to the right guys if I can't answer them myself. Um, the other thing too, um, if you do want to see some of our past Shop Talk Live Aluminum Series uh, streams that we've done, uh, we've covered quite a few things already um, in this series. So we've covered some basic aluminum TIG, some basic aluminum MIG, um, material prep, um, you know, all kinds of things that we've already covered. Um, so if any of that stuff is sounds like something that you guys might want to take advantage of, I'll pop the link to that playlist in the chat well maybe i will might be too long too powerful um there we go um the other thing to stay up to date on any of our future shop talk live streams um you can take a look at this web page here we you can uh register to to view the next one once that registration link is is live. Um, the other option to make sure you stay up to date on those is to uh, subscribe to our channel and hit the notification button and make sure that notifications are turned on. Um, that way when we go live that you guys will get notified. Um, and I'll drop those other links to uh, things like the filler metal selection app and the filler metal selection chart in the chat here uh, for you guys. Um, and once again, thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Um, we appreciate you guys, 
hanging out and and tuning in for these. Um, it's it's nice to get that interaction with you guys and get those questions answered for you. All right. We're good. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 